Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Teacher's Point of View. Uh, really excited to introduce Nick and Nicholas Ovi, who's obviously had a, had a remarkable career. I mean, you've obviously, in some respects, were kind of failed by education, and you've obviously kind of gone abroad to America and uh, really found your kind of passion in, in the way you help children and um, kind of came back and, and obviously went into, into teaching here in the UK uh, and kind of fell in love with it, so never left, really, did you? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. Can, you, can you introduce yourself and, uh, and kind of the journey you've been on it as an educator? Educator and what kind of drove you to become a teacher? No problem. Um, I, my name's Nicholas Obi. Um, I've, I've been a head teacher of, of three different schools in the UK. Um, I ran an alternative provision, a studio school, and then a primary school. Um, and my journey um, really was I kind of left school with, with no qualifications, wasn't quite sure what I was going to do. Um, kind of failed a little bit by the system. I knew I was intelligent, but maybe wasn't pushed hard enough or had the right kind of guidance or teachers that actually believed in me. Um, and the other thing on the other, the other side of that was, I didn't know anybody that looked like me that went to university or went on to do anything like that. So for me, it was mapped out that I'd go and work in a factory with you know, my dad and his brothers and whatever else. So you're gonna go and work in, 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 in a factory. So that was kind of how it was mapped out for me. Um, but then I, I kind of had an epiphany when I, I went to visit a friend of mine at a university and realised, hold on, these people aren't as, they're not, they're not superly more bright than I am. You know, maybe I could actually do this. Um, and from then, you know, you, you, your, your horizons broaden and I wanted to, to kind of get into youth work to try and really stop uh people that look like me or people that were, were like me and give them the opportunities to, to to do something with their life kind of take the veil from from in front of them um and i ended up in the united states um working with with children at risk young offenders um working on a, a wagon train with uh nine covered wagons mules and horses traveling thirteen thousand miles on horseback from the, um, the tip of Texas all the way up to Pennsylvania, to Franklin in Pennsylvania, and then all the way down to Florida, which took over a year on horseback. You're only traveling at uh, four miles an hour. So it takes a long time. What was the purpose of that? Like, why, 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 did, why, why was that the, the thing to do with the young offenders? Right. So the, the, the program was kind of a... A lot of programs say that they can't use any kind of religion, religion um, within them. Um, and this was kind of, I wouldn't say an experimental program, but they, they had a lot of things to do with Native Americans. And um, so we slept in these 20 foot teepees and things like that. But what it was, was to take children out of their environments. Because children, um, whether you're you know, 14 or whether you're 18, you're still kind of a child. Uh, and you're used to your surroundings, you know, if you're from an in, inner city. So to be out on somewhere on the road, it takes away your instant gratification because, you know, I can't go and get that fast buck. I'm traveling at four mile an hour. And plus, the whole wagon train cannot move if you do not lock up, look after your animal. So then you learn responsibility about looking after something that's not just yourself. And there was loads of different things within that. Um, as I say, Native American uh, philosophy for certain things, um, Mother Earth, Father Sky, um, there'd be a group hug that would, would be passed all the way around a circle. Um, and there, 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 there was like counsellors, there was teachers, there was all these different people that worked and interacted with these, these young people that if they hadn't come to our programme, would have gone to an adult lockup facility. So these children were from Chicago, Philadelphia, New York, um, so Detroit, Pittsburgh, different, you know, lots of lots of inner city um, children that were very, very uh, troubled, let's say. And sometimes they just needed an out and, and, and kind of being on a wagon train and traveling that slowly, um, kind of gives people a time to actually work with with the counselors and different things like that
For sure. And then, and then what happened? So you, you obviously went, went uh, not hiking, but you went, you obviously, you tra- you kind of went mountain back yeah. in the specs. Uh, and, and then you came back to the UK, right? And, and Yeah, I came back to the UK. Um, I'd become, by the time I left uh, the United States, um, I was living in Philadelphia and I worked on the aftercare program, which was when the children got out of the, the, the wagon train or whatever else, different programs to get them back into their communities. They would go to a charter school and they would go, you know, you'd work with the probation officers or you'd get them into a normal school, so on and so forth. So it was an aftercare and I'd become a director by then. So I'd work my way up very quickly within an 18 month period and then I'd, I'd become a director. So I thought, um, misguidedly, I suppose, that I had relevant experience and knowledge that people would be biting my hand off when I got back to the, to the UK. <laughs> Yeah. So people were interested, but they weren't interested. Basically, they were like, well, you haven't got social work qualification. You haven't got youth work qualification. We can't help you. And I was like, but I've got all this experience. I don't think anybody, in, you know, in the UK has the kind of realm of experience that I have working with, you know, children at risk and young offenders and blah, blah, blah. I'm sure I, I could be of use somewhere. Nothing. I used to apply for lots of things, never heard anything. So then um, I saw um, an advert for the graduate teacher program. And I thought, well, okay, sounds interesting. Let me do, I can work on the job. I get paid. Um, I get my QTS and then I'll go back into youth work, you know, because my experiences with schools up until that point has been my experience and it wasn't positive. So me being a teacher wasn't kind of at the forefront of my mind. It was always to go back and work with um children uh, at risk and uh within a a week two weeks i was in love i was like this is this is it i want to do this but the other thing that was even more of an overriding emotion was there were children that were still like me there were still children that were being treated like i was treated and i'm not saying i was you know i was an angel or anything like that but there were still children that were kind of pushed to the side or made to feel less than um, other children. And I, and I, I, that really was like, that really grated. And I thought, well, one of the things that I need to do is I need to get as high as possible because I can influence those children in front of me in my classroom, but I'd hear them go to another classroom and then I'd hear the teacher raise their voice and I'd hear those children be thrown out of the class. And I'd be like, these children are are great in my class Mm -hmm. so the only way for me to 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 really have an influence is me to get as high as I possibly can in the school so that I can influence everything that's happening and what is happening in those classrooms so that those teachers are not throwing those kids out those children do not leave school and be like me and have to flounder for for years till they work out exactly what it is they want to do so you know within that first you know First term, I was like, I want to be a teacher in ten years, and, um, and I can people understand. were like, "That's that's that's that's, that's quite a, a stretch," because um, I, you know, I got into teaching when I was in my thirties, so it was like, people were like, oh, it's, "It's a stretch," and I was like, "Well, I need to have a high a, a high target, otherwise, what's the point of getting up in the morning?" And I want something to get me up and motivated and whatever else. Had no idea how I was going to get there, but luckily, I, I did it. Luckily, luckily, I did it. Um, you know, I, I, I worked in, in a secondary school in Wembley for um, eight years and then joined Future Leaders. And, you know, I, I, I was taught an awful lot in, in that um, period. I also went on um, residentials. We went to um, Boston to look at some charter schools to see, you know, how they influence children. Um, in the United States. So I had a, a really great education. And also, you know, I went on a, uh, a year long um, placement in a school that was unlike mine, because my school was, was very, um, in a very deprived area, um, free school meals and all those type of things. And then I went to kind of a more leafy suburby school in, in uh, Walsall. And uh, again, learn different different aspects of the role uh, in, in in leadership, and uh, and then luckily I I was offered the opportunity to go and 
um, take a alternative provision into a free school um, in Westminster. And, uh, you know, I jumped at the chance and, uh, you know, subsequently been, been on to, to two other headships. Amazing. I mean, what, what I find um, quite interesting, and, and obviously you didn't just mention it there, but obviously when you were um, when you were obviously in that position where you were kind of working with those young offenders, uh, obviously your goal plan was to kind of continue to do that. And what I remember when we first spoke, what, what I found really interesting actually about you was when you went into a classroom, your idea was to learn what you can, get qualified, and then go back into working with young offenders and making sure that they, they have a chance. Yeah. But then you kind of had an epiphany when you got into the classroom saying you can help these kids before they even get to that stage. And that's kind of why you stayed yeah. in education, didn't yeah. you? And, and yeah, definitely. That was another reason. Because I was like, well, you know, certain kids are being treated in a certain way like I was treated. Now I was lucky I had the right support network around me and, 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 and all that type of thing. So I didn't then get, get dragged into anything that could have been really, really negative that could have put me down an avenue to... to um, detention or, or or anything like that but I could see some children that I could see without the right kind of guidance and the right kind of belief you know especially in London we have a lot of, of, of young males anyway that their self-belief is is lacking you know and and where they get their their self-esteem from is not where we'd like them to get it from and it was important for me because I looked like them to show them what was possible because it's important as well that our leadership teams reflect. You know, I wrote an, an article for The Guardian uh, a few years back um, about the fact that our leadership teams need to reflect those children that are walking through the gate every day. They need to see that, OK, those people look like me. So the more you can see people that look like you, the more you think it's possible. So that was another reason why I thought, you know what, I can hit these kids here and they never, ever have to get to, to the, the issue of being locked up or incarcerated or anything like that. Yeah, amazing. And then obviously you had you, you were head you were in headship of like in three different schools, and then you kind of got um, kind of uh, not headhunted, but you kind of got approached about changing the curriculum in in the Cayman Islands, and you've been a yeah. part of the project, haven't you? I mean, what, what have you been doing over there? Right. So um, uh, I got here just over a year ago, and we were implementing the key stage uh, one and and two um, curriculum. Uh, the UK curriculum to the Grand Cayman Islands um, and Cayman, Little Cayman and Cayman Brack. And what it was is to, to raise the standards and standardise some of the, um, the teaching, but also the high expectations. Because one of the things about the um, Key Stage 1 and Key Stage 2 curriculum in the UK, when it was introduced, things that were in key stage three say like in year eight year nine started to get pushed down so kids in year six were now doing stuff that they used to be doing in year eight and year nine in secondary school so all this work had been pushed down which obviously led to an increase in standards and you know the abilities of those pupils going in to secondary school so that's kind of the idea of, of trying to bring the curriculum here to raise standards and to, to raise attainment uh, and achievement here. So what we, we've had to do was, was utilise the UK curriculum, but then tailor it a little bit to some of uh, the nuances of, of the Caribbean. Um, we've had to liaise with um, people from the UK and around the world to try and get the right kind of trainers in um, and to get the right kind of uh, resources in. Um, and hire the right kind of staff that can can implement some of what we've been doing. So we're having to, to liaise with the DFE um, to make sure that next year, um, when they do the Key Stage 1 SATs and Key Stage 2 and the phonics test and all that, we'll be doing it at the same time so that we can then ratify exactly where we are in regards to, okay. to the UK. So that, um, again, there is a standard 
that we can then say, okay, we're not there yet, but this is what we're trying to attain. And this is what we're trying to... So it's a standardization so that everybody is very, very clear. Because I think at times things weren't as clear as, as, as they, they were um, after we started the curriculum. Absolutely. I mean, you, you talk about the curriculum and obviously it's amazing because um, the UK curriculum, it does have its pros and cons. But one of the big pros of the UK curriculum is how high it is perceived to be academically compared to other countries across the world. And and in terms of the research that goes into actual teacher training, yes, it could be improved and there's elements I'm sure that could be yeah. could be. But overall, the research that's done into into sort of training teachers and the right research done into the psychological aspects of how children learn. I mean, there is a lot that goes into it. And a lot of countries across the world will look at the British curriculum and think, you know what, they do really like they do brilliant things. <clears throat> However, my, my obviously speaking to so many people on this um, on this podcast, I've, I've realized that it, there is a slight issue. And, and that is what we were speaking about before we started recording. And, and that is the lack of understanding of how the world has changed and why we need to kind of bring in less maybe exam centralized exam based uh, assessment and, and work on like assessing interpersonal skills and softer skills and things that are actually so relevant in the real world at the moment in terms of talking to people oral communication and like just just basic things that i don't think that we're necessarily teaching in in, in our curriculum at the moment and sorry i know obviously I'm, I'm waffling on a bit but in terms of like uh, finland and denmark we look at their models and they've got some of the best education systems in the world and yeah. I don't know if you know about the most recent change, but they've gone from subject based to topic based. So what that does yeah. is it allows you to kind of have the freedom to maybe mix biology and PE and people that are really interested in sports. Now they can suddenly learn science and, and kind of learn because it's of interest and it gives you the adaptability to, to adapt the curriculum to, to way that's going to get the best out of your children, you know? And I think that's really where England is curriculum is lacking at the moment, you know? I, I, I'd like to say that, um, you know, I was a head of a, of a primary school that, that, you know, we did really well, um, but we were topic based. We, we were topic based. So every term, you know, it might be the Romans and that Roman theme would go through through everything with the science, with the uh, English, with the mathematics. The Romans and, and arts and, and everything would be going through that curriculum and it would it would help bring in other things, because, again, as you said, and we, and we were talking about um, prior to this, was, you know, we're in a generation where they, they, their attention spans are not like it used to be 20 years ago or 30 years ago before mobile phones. Everybody's kind of like a, a five minute snapshot and then they're moving on to the next thing. You know, a YouTube, you watch a YouTube video, you move on. So it's important that we, we, we tap into the, some of that. Um, to, to, to get children really, really focused on different aspects so that, yes, you like this, but math is, math is in that. And, oh, you, and, and uh, you know, we're learning about the Olympics. You know, and then, so you've got geography in that. You've got, you know, you've got history in that. You've got, you can write about literacy. You can talk about how many countries that are involved. So you can talk about mathematics and then you can, it's, it's not saying it's endless, but it tries, we try to do it to try and get children really, really engaged in different aspects of the curriculum by using a topic based um, yeah. environment. And that's something that we have tried to, to bring in over here. It is slowly getting embedded, but it's again, it's trying to teach people that have never used that before yeah. how to plan to, to integrate something like that. So, because, you know, because it's a brand new curriculum. There's an awful lot to learn in that in general. And then here comes this, this British guy that says, and I want you to do topic based. And they're like, C can we just learn how to do this bit first? <laughs> so, so there's, you know, there's some different nuances that we, we, we're trying to work with at the moment. It's amazing, isn't it? Because education is evolving. I mean, we're, we're genuinely, I think this year has initiated this kind of a, not revolution, but evolution in some respects of, of where education is going. And a lot of people feel like, you know what, are we getting the best for our kids? Oh, why are we comparing inner city London kids to kids from rural areas? Why are we generalizing the way education is, you know? And like, um, again, going back to Finland and Denmark, what they're doing really well is, is they, they are adapting the, the curriculum based on their children and what's going to help them learn. I mean, if, 
I, I remember, I don't know if you know who Gavin McCormack is, but he's on uh, a principal in, in Australia. And he talks about yeah. how you can inspire children. So instead of teaching them about the, the mechanics of a volcano, like, like talk to them about the experience that you had and like what you saw when you went there. And it's about inspiring these kids. So, through that conversation, those kids are really intrigued to know what's going to happen next. Do you know what I mean? And, it, it, and, and that's the thing about education. As a teacher, your job is in some respects changed because like you said, you can get information on your phone very quickly, you know, but in terms of yeah. like, your job as a teacher, it's not to give them that information necessarily, but it's inspired them to want to learn about that subject. And it's to give them like some, some motivation to want to actually like take an interest in that subject opposed to just giving them information like we used to, you know? Um, and I think that's where we haven't changed yet enough. I think we still need to make that, that change in, in the way we get to these kids. Yeah. I, I mean, I told you a story uh, when we, when we spoke before about me taking children um, to jump out of an aeroplane yeah. and uh, you know, again, you know, that that's from trying to tap into <laughs> The, the, the psyche of fear and you know fear is the thing that stops us from doing so many different things and when people come from certain areas they've never been exposed to certain things that you would take for granted if you went to a, a private school or you went to a, you know um a, a fee-paying school so i had a conversation and children asked me there were six formers they, they asked me you know what would be um one of the, the things that I'm most proud of. And, you know, I said, well, you know, I did a parachute jump and, and um, it helped me overcome an awful lot of fears about certain things. And they were like, what would you mean, sir? And I was like, well, you know, if you jump out of an aeroplane, because that's the scariest thing that I can imagine ever, anybody ever doing, you are not going to fear maybe asking that girl out on a date or you might not fear um, going to university or you might not fear doing certain things because at the end of the day nothing's ever going to be as scary as sitting on the edge of an airplane and somebody says jump you know so that kind of evolved in terms of it stopped it helped me in in regards to those kind of things oh well actually if i can jump out of an airplane i can apply for that job or yeah. i can do that or i can do this and we took, eventually we took, you know, 20 students and uh, six formers that had their waivers and they had it all signed off and they all came back in one piece and, and we jumped out of an aeroplane. And, you know, most of them went on to university and most of them um, acknowledged the fact that it was, it was a life-changing experience for them. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy because like statistics show that children actually learn a lot outdoors, don't they? But yeah, yeah. we're we're very fixated in in the uk in particular to to stay within classrooms and learn in those four walls where there's there's so much more that yeah. we we can kind of get our children by like getting them out to the to nature and to just the outdoors and you know it's interesting because this lady uh, called pavla she, she's a teacher in dubai and she basically sort of said to me tj like when you go outside when you go for a walk like when you're talking to people are you more relaxed and like you are, you, you tend to be a little bit more free when, and you, you tend to be um, kind of more like open to, to like just, I, I think you just get to be more open. Whereas if you're sitting in a four, four wall classroom, you're going to be very restricted in the way that you can kind of express yourself and the way that you yeah. can kind of ask questions. Do you know what I mean? It's very restrictive. And I think, yeah. it, like, again, I know we kind of badge on about like how education is flawed. I mean, education is an amazing thing. And, but it's, but why in the 21st century, when the world has got smaller respects because of technology, we can see, we can see what other people are doing. Why not collaborate and, and work together and, and take nuggets from each education system that's doing really well. Maybe like, and, and, and fizzle out the things that aren't working so well, but come yeah. on come together and maybe not necessarily one overall curriculum but a curriculum that you can use and adapt to what's going to be best for your children and i think that's kind of where where education needs to move now in some respects do you, do you think it's similar yeah I th I th but but you you kind of hit the nail on the head the, the difficulty is then who leads that yeah. across the world who, who 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 takes charge of that and says this is the model that we need to use i think but i think we we need to be moving in, in the direction I've had this conversation many times without my teacher's hat on saying what are we teaching in in schools that children can't just pick up their phone and and and, and find out you know we talk about the battle of Hastings and all those kind of things that are you know you remember and whatever else 
But if you need to find out about the Hastings, you, you go Google or you, you know, nowadays they don't even have to type it in. They say Alexa or they say, you know, and tell me about the Battle of Hastings and the voice will come on and it'll tell you about it. Why do I have to spend three weeks learning about it and writing it down and writing dates and, and memorising all those type of Absolutely. things? Now, that might come across as controversial, but the truth is, are we setting these people, people, are we setting these children up for success in the next 20, 30 years, the way that technology is moving forward. You know, you, 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 you look on the internet at any given time. I've seen Amazon are, are designing a, a car um, that is driverless. So there's so many different things in terms of our technologies moving forward. Are we equipping our children for what is to come? And so that is a very, very valid uh, and a very good question. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's true, because obviously, you, you, are we equipping them? And that's a very good question. And you talk about kind of the Battle of Hastings. I mean, the only thing I remember about the Battle of Hastings is it was in 1066. But, I mean, in terms of real-life um, kind of, like, application to why I've been successful or where I've got to, I mean, that has no relevance to my life whatsoever, right? And, and but, I mean, I wasn't very academically bright, but in terms of my conversation skills and the being able to do presentations or whatever, I mean, that's kind of where I shine. But, I, obviously, I left school thinking I wasn't very good, you know? Like, I mean, I left school, like, went to a mediocre university. Me like thinking, oh, I'm only going there because all my mates are going. My mom and dad wanted me to go, but I had no inspiration of wanting to learn. I wanted to just crack on with my life, and or I didn't really know what I wanted to do. In fairness, and I think that's the problem with education at the moment. In in some respects, is we kind of expect children to know what they want to do. You got to go, you do you, cast at sixteen, and know exactly what you want to study and do what for the rest of your yeah. life. You know, I only got into recruitment when I was twenty four. So I mean, what what preparation is there? And and that's the thing now is. There's so many different industries and this industry is evolving on a daily basis. Well, on a daily basis, you're right. On a daily basis, things are popping up, especially through COVID. You know, we, we won't see some of those industries um, that are now starting to, to bubble yeah. take, take fruition really till next year and the year after. And you'd be like, that never existed, but they'll be part of our lives and an integral part of our lives in the next two, three years, but they've just come up out of COVID. Yeah. And, 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 and that's what I'm saying. You, 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 you're right. Are we getting the best? Because I know, I mean, your story is similar to mine, you know, in terms of our, our schooling. But I've got further because I was a reader, you know, uh, as a child. I read a lot, so my vocabulary was good and, you know, I could communicate, which meant I could hold my own with people that were probably better educated and more, have more pieces of paper, should I say. You know, I've got, I got, I got to make that clear. More, not, better, more pieces of paper. <laughs> um, and, and the thing is, you get further in life by having those softer skills that we don't, Absolutely. you know, we don't put a, a big stock on within school because it's like work hard and you get a good job and, you know, that's pretty much the blueprint. You work hard, you get a job and, and then you got to work 40 years doing it. But <laughs> when you're 14 to 16 and you've got to make these choices, how many children really, really know what they want to do? Absolutely. You know, you know, how, how, you know, and then, as you say, you get to 23, 24. And to be honest, an awful lot of people, I'd say 80, 90 percent of the chip people that I know that went to university are doing something that has nothing to do with their degrees. Yeah. Absolutely. No, nothing to do with their degrees. Yeah, absolutely. yeah. You know, I did I did a sports science degree. I'm, I'm a head teacher or was I a head teacher? So you, you, you never know. Yeah. The education's great and 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 learning and, and developing and becoming responsible and all those type of things, why university is great. Yeah. But in terms of learn this and, and go off and do it, most people really don't know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it, the, world, the world has changed so much. And, and it's uh, obviously, I remember doing my business degree. And it, obviously, I know it's past secondary, but in my business degree, it, what they taught me was how to become a manager in a company, never had to become an entrepreneur, which obviously is one of the main reasons I went to do a business degree, funny enough. Um, but it's irrelevant right but the point i'm trying to make is nowadays it, the, the the world is changing at such a fast pace so uh, to, to have exam style assessments to, to kind of question if you're going to be successful in the future 
to assess whether you're going to be successful in the future when the, the world is, and the markets are changing so rapidly. I think what the questions we need to be asking is, how are we going to assess whether the children are going to be able to adapt to the, the changing world? And, and, and a lot of that comes down to soft skills, interpersonal skills, like are yep. they going to be able to use initiative? Are they going to have leadership skills about them, like entrepreneurship? Are they going to, because you, you look at the world at the moment, 20 years ago, there was like five estate agents down the high street. Now there's about 30. Every corner you go to, there's an estate agent. There's going to be more and more, um, there's less market, I mean, there's less, there's less monopolies in, in the world now than there ever were. There's more independence starting up on a daily, weekly basis, right? And it's about how do you prepare people to, to make sure that they're going to succeed on their own two feet opposed to having to work for someone because those days are gone now, you know? It, it's it's yeah. about kind of giving people, children, an opportunity to, to believe in themselves and, and to realise, you know what, they can make something out of something even if they're not necessarily good at maths or English or science, you know? Right, yeah. And, and, and you know... For, for me, in, when, when, I, when I, I, I worked in the UK, and, and especially in my early days of, of, of teaching, they had a kind of conversation I used to have all the time, which was, you know, what is it you want to do? And, 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 you know, I don't care if you want to be a bin man, but the fact is, why don't you want to own the whole station or run the whole station or run the whole of London for, yeah. for you know, for, for refuge collectors? That's... You, don't always just sell yourself short and say, right, I'm going to do this. Why don't you think about owning all of it? You know, you want to be a hairdresser, fine. But wouldn't it be better to own 10 of those shops and you and having those kind of conversations? Because you're talking about making people see beyond what is right in front of them and think, OK, why shouldn't you have 10 shops or you have a shop in every, every town in, in the UK? That's the kind of... Thing that we should be preparing children from for you no know? um and it's something that if you went to private school let's be honest you would have a lot more of that com those conversations with people about how to have generational wealth how to hold on to your money how to make your money work for you when you're sleeping rather than you know you earn and then you got to get up and you got to go we have to change that but i don't know if the system is built for those to retain wealth, which is a different, another conversation, different conversation, and for those to, to continue to feed those that hold on to the wealth. That's a different conversation. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny you talk about that because uh, I don't know if you've ever watched The Crown on Netflix, but in 1950, there was a prime minister that, came, that went into Eton College and, and basically he, said, he spoke to these kids and said 14 out of the last 30 prime ministers have come from this college. What, what the world wants is, so what society wants is that there to be more, of a, more equality and more people to come from different backgrounds and kind of go into those roles. And he says, I think that's absolutely rubbish. I think everyone should come from like here you know basically because he was from eating himself but it just kind of backs up your point i think like education sorry <coughs> sorry um but education has moved and degrees unless you're going to become a doctor a teacher uh, um, a lawyer or an, an accountant you don't need to go to a degree to get a degree to be successful anymore it's it's about what you bring to the table you know and well how are we preparing children in schools to make sure that they are ready for that step yeah and I think I think you you for me resilience is 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 key. How do you measure resilience? You know we have a lot of children, and you and you see it in in, in young people whether it's in sport and you know they give up a lot easier than we used to. All right, but I'm not going to get on that soapbox. But I'm saying you know resilience, communication, um, um, being able to think uh, with common sense. Um, being able to ask the right kind of questions. All these things should be measured, not the piece of paper that you have, because there are always going to be people that are going to be book smart and, and, and be very focused and they can write out different things. But the people that actually make things happen are the people that interlink those, that mm -hmm. can communicate well, think rationally and go, OK, well, I see what you're saying, but if we do it this way, this is what the outcome will be. Let's go and do it this way. And everyone goes, oh, yeah, I hadn't thought about it like that. Let's do that. They're the kind of people, but it's how you measure those skills within within a school Absolutely. because they're the people that change the world. Yeah, absolutely. But that's a difficult, isn't it? I mean, the, the reason why the UK won't move from 
or, or find it difficult to move from the way it operates it's because it's very difficult to measure how you assess interpersonal skills you know or like these soft skills and it, like it's very data driven in the uk and this is again a big problem why the teacher re retention is is a massive issue in the uk is because what we're doing is we're overworking teachers on things that take them outside of the classroom data input um planning marking like th those things that aren't actually allowing them to be creative in the way that is going to be best for those children and and this is what again and i keep going back to Finland and denmark but it's only because I've, I've only found out about what they're doing recently and i'm so impressed by what what they're doing but they, they're actually given complete autonomy so this is the curriculum now you choose how you want to go and actually deliver it to your children you know your children best here in the uk it's very data driven you get labeled by by leaderboards you get labeled by often sorry and then you you kind of get ranked in leaderboards and what it kind of only, it only ends up doing is giving the, the schools that are are in sort of trouble in some respects in require improvement or special measures it gets them labeled and nobody wants to go bloody work there to make an improvement and it just gives them an even more of an impossible task to to kind of improve whereas in other countries like the, the inspection the way they do inspection is they say look hey, this, this is what we've seen in your school this is what you probably need to improve on but they don't label you they don't say you require improvement you're you're outstanding they say we're here to support you but ultimately you know your children and here's our feedback go do what you've got to do you know but here in the uk it's completely the opposite yeah i think and i don't want to sound again too controversial but here we have people that never went to a public school um, you know, never went to a comprehensive or whatever else. For the for, for the most part, that make decisions on what should be seen in a in a in a comprehensive school. Okay, so their education was completely different. They would have, as you say, they might have gone to Eton or or you know Harrow or, or you know an elitist school, um, and they would have been taught in a slightly different way and slightly different subjects even. And then they say, right, okay, well, this is how it should be done in a comprehensive school, you know? And, you know, I've said before, we wouldn't go into hospitals and go, oh, Mr. Brain Surgeon, I don't like the way you're doing that. You shouldn't do it like that. You should do it like this, <laughs> yeah? Because I've been in a hospital, you know? I've been in a hospital, so that means I know what hospitals should be and you're not doing it properly. But that's what we do with schools. I went to school, so you know what? I'm an expert, tell you what, I don't like the way you're doing that. Yeah. So we're going to do it like this. Okay. What's the evidence <laughs> behind that? Yeah. Well, uh, it's how I was taught when I was at school. Yeah, but that was 30 years ago. Yeah, but it's, it's how I was. So that's what we should do. And that's what happens. So the people in, in, in power will come in, implement something, because maybe it's the way they learn or, or something that they're familiar with. And sometimes it does has no basis in any kind of statistical data to back up or research to back up why well, this would be the best. You know, the, like the EBAC. I know that if the EBAC had been around when I was at school, I would have failed even more. I'd have been like, what do you mean I've got to do this? I am not. I have no interest in this. Yeah. But you're saying that only clever people do the EBAC. Again, we're putting labels on, on, on children that doesn't need to actually ha take place. Absolutely. And we, we talk about labels. Um, I will just jump into labels in, uh, actually, we, we talk about labels, right? And you, you, you obviously, you worked in an alternative provision. So you know yep. about, and you've, you've had children that have been completely dis, dis, disposed okay. in some respects okay. uh, in, in terms of like from their schools and they've, they've, the schools have felt like they're, they're, not, they're not kind of good enough to go where they are or they're, they're too much trouble. But obviously you look at the psychology of that. That is telling a child that they're not good enough you know, and, and instead of like understanding what the where the issues lie, you're kind of sending them away for somebody else to deal with, you know. And so uh, what chance have they got when, when they are expected to go out and work to then not end up in prison or end up in a, in, in, in sort of in a position where you're not going to earn a lot of money? Because you, that, that, your job as a teacher in some respects is to kind of find their niche and find what inspires them and kind of get them to engage in that. I know it's a lot to us, but that's why you get into teaching. That's why you want to make a difference yeah. Do you know what I mean? Not to kind of teach the 30 kids in a, like in a robotic way that it's going to be generalised to everybody. It's about finding the, the individuality in children. So when you talk about Gavin Williamson kind of 
like uh, telling you how to teach yeah. and he's in the classroom and that something like that might work for him. It's, it's irrelevant because every single person learns in their own way, you know? And, and it's like, how can you tell, it's like Google, they, they, they pride themselves on individuality. Like they've got an office that is tailored to so many different people. If you want to play table tennis, you play table tennis, you play snooker, you want to have a nice meal. I mean, it's tailored to every single person to, to inspire people, make people want to be there. And, and that's where I think the, the profession is let down by the people in power because they're not allowing them to do that. They're not letting them to be creative, allowing them to really understand their children and get to adapt the curriculum in the way that's going to be best for those kids. Yeah, but, but it, 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 it would take a massive change and not everybody likes change. Cool. And, and also maintaining and, and controlling change is also you know, something that, that scares people as well. Um, Denmark done it. Why can't we do it? Um, again, for me, I'm going to say I'm going to pass on that question because you know that, that that's a that's a really interesting question, but it would take an awful lot of of manpower and you know resources to to facilitate that change. And the other thing is, there's going to be children. There's going to be a generation that's going to fall down in the wayside while that change was taking place. Because whenever there's a new curriculum or whatever, children always fall down that year or two years while things are being embedded. There's always, you know, that that change. But in the long run, it could be the, the, the way forward. So I wouldn't disagree with on you on no. I mean, I get what you're saying, but I think sometimes we, we discredit children for how, how resilient they are. And I know, obviously, some of it is traumatic, but children will be all right. I mean, yeah, right, cool, it might, it might impl- it impact them for a couple of years. But overall, like, children will get on with it. Like, they will kind of, like, carry on. And, um, it, it, and I think in that period, it's very important to hone in on their sort of resilience and focus on their interpersonal skills and their soft skills to make sure that they're still going to be set up for life, not necessarily through academic results. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, I think what, what you're basing that on is that those children will suffer is basically they may not achieve the same results as pre- previous years, but the whole idea is that we adapt the, the way that we're kind of assessing them anyway, you know, and, and a big part of that will need to move towards our interpersonal skills and the softer skills. Um, but I mean, it needs to happen because you, you talk about uh, those children falling behind and for a couple of years they might, but look how many children are already falling behind in the system that we've got. Yeah, there might be a couple of extras, but some of these children will actually probably benefit from their changes. So it's very hard to measure and it is a change. It is a lot of manpower and it's, it's obviously understand it's a difficult task, but it needs to happen, I think. I, I, I do think, you know, um, a lot of these children are now called the indigo children. Um, and uh, where they question a lot more than, than, than our generations did or, or generations that came directly after me. And, you know, th- 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 there's a thirst for knowledge, but not necessarily what the schools are giving them because they have so much power at their fingertips to go and read, to go and, to go and look at. There is a thirst for knowledge, but not necessarily what we're teaching them. And as you say, I think we, we have to take a step back and see what is it that these children need so that we can nurture them to grow and and develop into the next stage of our evolution, let's say. Let's, you know, if we're gonna be deep about it, the next stage of our evolution as a human race. What are we, you know, we're still doing things that we did 100, 100, 150 years ago. Education is still built on the same foundations. But, you know, is that conducive really? to be changing the world and if we are going to explore worlds and different things that people talk about we're going to be doing as a human race in the next thousand years or whatever else are we pushing that evolution along by doing things as we always did yeah i mean i guarantee you if we continue to do it the way we do it we're doing it the education like in the uk will fall down the ranks continuously and, and that's because you've got places like China, Finland, Denmark, Australia, Thailand that are, are really changing in the way that they educate. And education is key. It is absolute key for economic growth in the long run. And if we don't have skilled labour, if we don't have skilled workforce, we are going to fall behind. Our GDP will fall. We're not going to be able to export our, uh, our services. We're not going to have money coming into the country. People ain't going to want to invest in the UK as a whole, you know. And it, it all stems from education. It all stems from this is our future workforce. So... Yeah. If we're going to compete globally as an economy, this little island as we've done for hundreds and hundreds of years, we need to come up with the goods because we don't we don't produce any 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 
um, any goods in the UK. So we, uh, most of our goods in the UK are imported. So we, we've got to bear that in mind, that 70% to 80% of the money that we make in the UK is leaving because we're having to import our goods. So we need to we need to create value in what we do. And that is what we do in the service industry. You know, we, we are very creative. We are very like technologically advanced. But we need to now have a workforce that is going to be able to continue to improve that. And right now, the way we're going, we're still assessing them in ways that we did to 50 to 100 years ago, where you would get do well with maths, go get a degree, and then boom, like you're gonna you're gonna have a successful career. But nowadays, people get first class honours, and they still end up working in Tesco. You know, yeah. they don't really matter anymore. So it, it, it absolutely needs to change. I mean, the Western society, in some respects, is falling behind, like the UK and the USA, and and like the, the countries around that were kind of developing are now kind of overtaking us and. If education rankings are, are, are showing us anything, is that we are slipping. We are slipping massively. Yeah. And if we, like, it, just because our system worked for such a long period of time, it doesn't mean that we can't make it better. And I think this is the big problem that we have here in the UK is that we've had a, a system that worked for so long, and we're not really to get ready to give it up yet. No, I can't. I can't disagree with anything you've just said. Then no, um, I can't disagree with anything you just said. But obviously, you you work as a head teacher, right? And obviously, you're not yeah. in the UK at the moment, so you probably have a little bit more flexibility in terms of what you yeah. can do. But I mean, like being as a, as a senior leader uh, and and being yeah. a head head teacher, like where do your frustrations lie in the way that you have to kind of operate your schools and and the lack of autonomy that you might have had? I think there is um, a feeling that you've got to jump through hoops um, to keep people that really aren't maybe that interested happy um and, and i mean you know governance in terms of you know the government and things like that 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 you've got to jump through hoops and and hit certain targets that might not actually be what you think would be relevant or necessary for those children to know or learn or whatever else but you have to hit those those tick boxes all the way along and, and and the fine line is trying to, to to get those soft skills in as well as you know those academic milestones that you're trying to do now i understand in primary school you want to get phonics because if you, you get your phonics children read you want to you know you want to hit your time tables test and because that that opens up other doors i understand a lot of that i think the frustration when you're teaching um secondary school you know, in high school, I think, is a lot of those things have have lost as much meaning as they, they once did to 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 the to teachers and to the, the pupils that they teach. Now, there's some people that love their, their subject. You know, if you're a history teacher, you love your subject, so on and so forth. There's lots of people like that. But in general, the frustrations are, why am I teaching this when that person can press a button and the information's there. What, what else could we teach this person to develop them as an individual, as a person? You know, facts, learn this, recite this parrot fashion, and I say, that's brilliant, you get an A for that. That's not, that's not, that's not learning, that's not learning how to think, that's learning how to memorise something. And that's something that we've done for a long time. So things like that, are frustrating. You're teaching children how to memorize. You're not teaching them how to think, how to think rationally, how to think, you know, responsibly, how to, to, to ask the right kind of questions, you know, how to have investigative skills to say, well, actually, I'm not sure about that. Let me, let me dig a little bit. They're the things that we need in workplaces, as yeah. you've said before. Not so much, well, okay, I've memorized all these dates for this history exam. Let me and you know yeah I got an A for it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean it's it's uh, it's it's quite like sort of dis it's alarming in some respects that we haven't kind of like changed. I mean obviously you've you've you ne may not necessarily have believed in what you were told to do, but you obviously had to implement it. I mean yeah. how much hindrance was it in terms of the vision that you had for a school for your school? To, to have to kind of jump through these hoops to, but when you want to try and to actually give these children the best education possible. I mean, what how, for, for, for me, especially in, in, in the primary school that I, I took over at the end, 
um, which was in requires improvement when I took over, hadn't been uh, classed as a good school for over 15 years. So my job was to raise the academic standards. But for me, it was to do the other things as well. So we had things like the six R's. So we, you know, we talked about, it was, you know, being responsible, resilient, rational thinking, um, you know, so on and so forth. So we had these six, six R's that we spoke about constantly. So in the classroom, you know, somebody might say something and the teacher would say, is that being very rational? And then, you know, somebody, so you would try, we were trying to teach those skills because, you know, I knew from my own experience and, and like you've, you, you alluded to as well, is that how you came across was what opened doors for you and what people remember. And so when they're looking for somebody, they go, oh, remember that guy, he was really, really polite or spoke really well or da 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 Yet, let's, let's give that person a call. And that's what I was trying to create with, with my young people. But by doing that, by looking at people holistically, how do we improve the way they communicate, full sentences, you know, how do you sit? How do you, you know, how do you open, you know, you open a door for adults, you know, you stand to this, you do all of those kind of things we worked on constantly because then I would be satisfied with them, not only getting the academics, but I'm trying to make them good people when they left school. So for me, it was, okay, I've got to do that, but this is more important because this is going to take them further. I know people say that a piece of paper does, but that bit is the thing that, that really makes a difference in people's lives. So for me, it was, it was a pleasure actually trying to, to, trying to do both. I mean, I, I, obviously, I, I, my hat goes off to you and I respect you massively for it. But there's a lot of head teachers out in the UK that wouldn't adhere to, to their own moral obligation. And it's about ticking the box for Ofsted. And it's about ticking the box to make sure they can move up the rankings in terms of the leaderboard. Um, they, they jump through these hoops. And it's not about the actual well-being of these students on a, on a day-to-day basis. Because that is your number one job as an educator is, is the children, right? But some of these head teachers are more focused on... on being perceived as as a good rated or an outstanding school when they've taken over a failing school you know and how, how common do you think that is in the UK I don't to be honest I don't know you know I know that there's still people teaching in schools and classrooms that would have um made sure I failed when I was at school you know that's just that's just life there's still people there's still people in classrooms and in leadership teams that don't even like kids let's be honest they don't even like kids I don't know why they're in schools <laughs> That's the truth, okay? Um, but I'd like to think that the majority of people will look at their own integrity. I never wanted to walk into a school and look into a child's face and be fake. or Because I, I used to think children would see through that. Children will know. You know, when I was at school, you know, and I used to say this when I used to do, do talks and stuff. If you go into the worst school in the world, there'll be one teacher that nobody plays with. There'll be one teacher that nobody ever plays with. And even in the best school in the world, there'll be one teacher in there that's always been, that's always crying, can never handle a class. And that's the best school in the world. But in the worst school in the world, there'll be somebody that they go, oh, that's Mr. Such and Such. Don't mess about with him. Or don't mess about with her. Right. So I used to say that it doesn't matter. It's really how you use your own integrity to deliver whatever it is, whether it's in the classroom, whether it's in leadership. If you don't want to do this, there are easier jobs. Go and stack shelves. Do, do something else. Do something that makes you happy. Because for me, the most miserable thing that I could think about doing is getting up every day to get abused in a classroom. Why? Why would I, why would I get up, put on my clothes, and go and sit down in front of the kids that are going to abuse me all day? Mm. Sorry, I'll go and stack shelves. Seriously, I would... I would got better things to do with me time so your integrity and the relationships you build with children should then say he's in my corner and I'd like to think that I was I was an okay teacher but I got great results because I built relationships because mm. kids were ready to run through brick walls for me yeah, not actually. because I was the greatest practitioner but you know what I knew those children I knew what they liked you know I watched the most nonsense. I watched cartoons. I watched, I watched wrestling. I watched all the kind of nonsense so that I could build relationships with children yeah. so that I could say on a, on a Friday, 
uh, on, a, on a Monday morning when they came through the school gate. How was such and such? Did you see such and such wrestling the other day? Oh, yes, sir. Da, 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 da. Or your football team didn't well, win very well. Da, da, da. I built relationships by having those connections with children. And so it was authentic. The children knew that I was in their corner and never had to question whether Mr. Obi was, he'd say one thing to us and then do something in the staff room. It, it was never that. Yeah. I mean, you are salespeople, teachers, like you are, you, you sell knowledge and it's about your delivery. It, it, like your delivery is it, how, how good your delivery is, is how well the, the students will buy into you, you know? And, and in sales, we always say that there's, it's not about the product you're selling. It's about people buying into you, you know? And it, it's so down to, to, it's exactly the same with teachers. I mean, you can have the exact same teacher say, teaching the exact same thing, but people, will, children will buy into one teacher more because they trust in, it, trust in them. And it comes down to that word, trust i think ultimately trust, yeah absolutely trust. relationship like trust is the absolute key factor in any relationship if it's going to be successful and and i think uh, like we go back to that word trust if a teacher if children don't t- trust in that teacher then they're not going to buy the knowledge off them you know not a chance it's not interested you yeah, can but, talk to your blue in the face if i don't trust you i'm not interested that 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 and, and you see that in classrooms up and down the world Kids are disengaged, they're throwing, they're chatting, they I don't trust you. You're not here for me. You're here to pick up your money. You, and they'll, and this generation will tell you that as well. They'll be like, you ain't here because you really want to be here. You, you, know, you know, and, they, and they, they can be very, very blunt and forceful about it. Nobody ever told me that. Yeah. But I heard it. I heard it in other classrooms. Sir, he don't even like us. What's, what's he here for? You know, especially when I, you know, in, in, in high school, that's, I used to hear that all the time. I don't even like that teacher, sir, because they don't even, they don't even, they're not interested in us. Yeah. And you'd be like, okay, well, you've got to be respectful and whatever. Else. Yeah, well, they got to respect me. And I'd be like, okay, let's have another conversation. But this generation, as I said, are more inclined to have those kind of dialogues mm-hmm. about why are you here? What, what are you trying to bring to the table? Can I trust you? Can I not trust you? Is there respect there? Whatever else, your knowledge. Because as you say, I can get the knowledge that you're going to teach me from my phone. So what else you bring into the table? Yeah, for sure. Uh, and that's what the kids are. They're like, go on then, teach me. Because everything you're going to teach me, I can get from YouTube oh, yeah. or, or from, from the phone. So what else you bring in? <laughs> and, you, and, and that's, that's the generation that we have to work with. But this is why it goes back to my point that I was making. And this is why the system that we have here in the UK is failing teachers to fail the students. And and the reason why I say that, I know it's a big statement to make, but if teachers are, imagine trying to be a 100 metre sprinter and you're running against Usain Bolt, but you've only got, you're running with one leg. That is what it's like to be a teacher in the UK because you want to teach, you want to make a difference to these kids, but your, your arms are tied behind your back in some respects in the way that you can adapt the curriculum to teach these kids. Now, you, you talk about children, like te- teachers not kind of giving a, like an interest in children, but they have to follow certain guidelines and make sure that they tick these boxes. How can they like then inspire to have creativity to try to inspire these kids when they might completely go off the tick box and they'll get penalised for it, you know? Oh, you're talking to a head teacher. This is a difficult one for me. It's a difficult one for me because there's people out there that are doing it. There's people out there pulling up trees every day, doing exactly what you say. They, they, they're being creative. They're working within the, re- the remits of, of, you know, those stipulations. And they're still producing outstanding lessons. They're making those, those children enjoy the lessons and they're getting fantastic outcomes. So I get <laughs> I do get so, that. That, that's a difficult that's a difficult one for me because you know I've, I've got to kind of still sit in that head teacher's chair and say okay but you've got to, you've got to play the cards that you dealt with so so okay. so play them and play them to the best of your ability i get don't that. down tools don't blame the kids don't blame the community don't blame the parents don't blame whatever for not producing good work to those students and quality lessons to those students each day. Absolutely. That would be my only caveat to, to what you've said. I mean, I completely respect that and I get that, but you want to go into a private company, like progress from like a consultant to a manager 
without the adequate training. Now, yeah, there's some special teachers out there that can be quick on their feet and it can make stuff happen and they can be creative and, and, and be very innovative that the way that they can change the curriculum. But for a lot of teachers, they need that training, but those training systems aren't in place in your PGCE. They're not in, they're not in place in every school to, to be able to allow the teachers to have the res not necessarily the resources, but the right kind of equipment like mentally into, to make sure that they're tackling children's problems. Because we, I spoke to about other educators and in their PGCE, they, they're not at all taught about the psychology of, how children learn you know like there's there's some obviously there's some is there's some uh articles and there's some like le level of information but you are not taught how children on a on a, at a psychological level how they can learn and that is a problem in itself if you're going to try to be creative and try to adapt a curriculum that is very set in stone to try to get the best out of your children but you're not kind of being taught how to do that. Like, I mean, how can we expect teachers to be like every all those those phenomenal teachers that have done it without getting the right support to do it? I, I mean, that that's a structural issue. I think. I think it is absolutely. You know, it's like what we're trying to do here uh, in terms of looking at where the best practice is to make sure that we can then share that great good practice across the island. You know, you know, when you've got that expertise, those champions that can deliver exceptional lessons, how can I utilize that knowledge and help other people in other classrooms? Absolutely. So I think structurally, you know, those, those colleges that you're talking about maybe need to, to take a long, hard look at, at, at what they're delivering. Um, but again, everybody's kind of a cog in a wheel that has to follow some sort of blueprint that has already been set in stone that this is what you must do you know this is how we want the pgce or the qts to, to to be delivered go and deliver it you know and and we we're never high enough in order to kind of change maybe some of those those systems that 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 are imparted on us to make these things um uh, you know come about really yeah, I mean it's uh, and again it's no fault to educators or head teachers or senior leaders. It's it's a systemic problem that's that's been around for a long time. And we, I think, a big problem as human beings in general is that we expect other people to behave in the way that we behave. So it, like, and, and when they don't meet those expectations, they've let us down. And that's the problem. Like with the 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 world being so individual. Yeah. Yeah. And, and being so unique in every single way. I mean, if everybody was the bloody same, there, there would be no cost in Starbucks. It'd just be Costa, you know? Like, and, and it'd be no PlayStation 4. It'd be like just an Xbox. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Everybody, yeah. like everybody's different, and like for, for teachers to kind of just come in and adapt to some teachers that are really well with, like doing really well in the profession. I mean, those are expectations that we structurally are on, like really being fair on, on some of these teachers because they need that support, they need that training. Some of these people aren't going to be head teachers, but we still need them on the front line in the classrooms. And like just because they're not at a certain caliber compared to other people, it doesn't mean that they're not good enough to be a teacher. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. And that's a problem because in the statistics show within five years, teachers leave the profession and recruitment, ret uh, teacher retention is an absolute nightmare at the moment, you know? Um, I mean, like, what, what are your thoughts? Like, what, what needs to change structurally? Obviously, you've been in the headship role and I, I get you. Yeah, uh, but again, I, I got into to education later on. So yeah. for me, I got into education after doing, doing different things and were like, and was basically like, this is me. I want to do this. Rain or shine, I want to do this. I think it, in some ways, I'd almost say, don't become a teacher till you've gone and maybe travelled and done different things and seen a bit of the world a little bit. Because it's not easy standing up in front of 20, 30 children teenagers um is nerve-wracking mm -hmm. and 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 it really isn't an easy job people think oh yeah teachings yeah i'm going to give them this information but kids aren't going to sit there quietly they're not going to you know um you have to, to to be able to to bring something to the table so i think the raw materials going into these colleges i would like to think would have a little bit more experience or have had some sort of, yeah, a little bit more experience 
um, and maybe we've had test tasters to say, yeah, this is exactly what I want to do. Yeah. Because teaching, yeah, there's holidays and all that stuff that people talk about teaching. But to be honest, teachers deserve those holidays because yeah. most people that have two or three children, when I say, would you want to be stuck with those children at home all day, every day for eight hours and have to teach them stuff? Most parents go, nah, I'm not, I'm not interested. Nah, 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 nah. I'll stick them in front of the TV. I'll do this, do that. So it is a difficult job. So I would think that experience, but then to, because they, they talked about teach first and, and people like that. So they were getting these high um, graduate caliber um, two ones and, and things like that, that were going to go straight into be teachers. And yeah. they produced some really good teachers. And then a lot of them then went off to, to work for consultancy firms or, or whatever. So they were kind of basically giving back um, to the community. Um, and, and, and I met a lot of really, really great, innovative teachers that did it. But again, it is not a role or a job that no matter how bright you are, it is mentally draining. It is you know, the resilience has to be on point. You know, there's days where it doesn't matter how good a teacher you are, there's days where you just think that was an awful lesson or that was just a nightmare, you know, and you just want the ground to swallow you up. And these are things that you learn from, but there are easier ways to make money. So again, it's, I'd, I'd rather people that got into the profession knows this is what I want to do. And I want to do this when I'm 40. You know, I want to do this when I'm 50. You know, I can see myself doing this. I don't want people to come in at 21 and go, oh, it's not kind of what I wanted. No, it's not. This isn't kind of what, mm, nah. And then, then they bounce out because, you know, they leave, they leave this massive get, gap. So I think people need to, to really interview um, and the selection process needs to be a little bit harder to kind of weed out people that are are in it for the wrong reason, let's sure. say, for the wrong reason. I mean, it's hard though, isn't it, Nicholas? Because like, it, it's hard enough trying to get a maths graduate to, to get into teaching when they can make so yeah. much money in other industries. Do you know what I mean? So, I mean, it, it's almost like, well, I don't want to say this, but it's almost like going back to the, the cliche of beggars can't be choosers in some respects, because a physics graduate a science graduate a, a maths graduate a pure science graduate jesus christ try to get them into teaching profession i mean a, long, a couple of weeks ago i called through 206 computer science graduates and i found one that wanted to go into teaching it spent i spent like about 10 solid hours of calling and one one wanted to go into teaching it's like it's it's hard because you don't go into teaching for for the money you, you go to make a difference but you don't Money, money would help. I mean, every teacher in 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 the Grand Cayman Islands, their 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 salary is um, they get uh, uh, five grand a month, tax free. That's quite good, um, but yeah, it's more than quite good. So so whether you've been teaching ten years, whether you've been teaching one year, you come out with five grand a month, tax free each month. I mean, can I have a job? <laughs> um, but no, it's, uh, I mean, that's, that's phenomenal. Obviously, here in the UK, it's, it's not like that at all. No, it? it's not. You know, and I tell people all the time, I'm like, you know, I started at, you know, on, on, on the first rung yeah, of the pay scale, you know, in, 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 in 2021 20, or what it was, 21 or 22, something like that, when I first started. And I said, you guys start, you know, at 60 grand. <laughs> and it doesn't matter if you're good, bad or indifferent. That's, that's where it becomes a bit more difficult. Because, you know, you've got people that are great and you've got people that are poor, but they're all earning the same big salary. Yeah. So the other thing there is how do you then want, you want people to become leaders, but what's my incentive to become a leader? Yeah. I'm getting good money. I'm good. Yeah. I'm going to sit back here and I'm just, I'm good. So yeah. there's, there's other things comes with paying people more money as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, but don't get me wrong. If I was to ask people in the UK, like teachers in the UK, what would you want? Like, out of, like what would make your job easier? I guarantee you 90% of them would probably say time over money. Like, like take away the, the data input in the, like the, 
the, the, the things that take me out of a classroom, the planning, the market, give me more time in more PPA to make sure that I deliver on form every single day to these children, but I can go home and, and on one. I mean, I guarantee you that would come over as priority over earning an extra couple of grand a year. Do you know what I mean? 60 yeah. grand is a whole different story, but I'm talking about like, you probably got a pay scale in the UK to yeah. buy two grand or whatever a year. Yeah. Um, but to have that time, I think that would cause... I mean, and the reaction to that would be retention would drop massively, in my opinion. I think the biggest reason why people leave the industry is because the extra planning and marketing, the data input, that it's very much taking you out of the classroom and doing what you do best. And, and that's being best for those children. Yeah, I think um, one of the things about education is, is that the better you become as a teacher, the less teaching you do. Yeah, which is which is one of the, the real conundrums of things. How 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 it's how it's kind of scheduled. You know that the better you are as a teacher, the more you get promoted, but the less teaching you you, you do. Yeah. Um. So I don't I don't know how you get around that. I don't know how you get around the data input and things like that because, to me, they are necessary. Mm-hmm. I need to know how that class is doing. I need to be able to say, okay, you tell me how those things are doing, and because of human nature. I don't always want to trust what that teacher tells me. Yeah, but I mean, I can, look books. I can look in the books. I can look at it. But I, I also would like a formative test to say, okay, they have learned that, that yeah. type of thing. So, yeah, they, they, yeah it's, it, I, I don't know. I think I muddy the waters a little bit on that one. But um, I think, yes, if we took away some of the bureaucracy, you would have more people that would stay in the game a lot longer. I get what you're saying. I do, obviously, with, with regards to what you just said. Um, I get the data input. I mean, and it's, it's, you've got a measure, but why can't we use technology? I mean, everyone's got a bloody phone, right? I mean, you, you get an app that kind of, you, you can put like where the kids are at, what they've learned, and you can kind of analyze at the end of the week, oh, this is what they've done, and this is how much they've progressed. Like, I mean, why does it have to be? That yeah. it? I mean, we, we, we had the, we, uh, I spoke to somebody not too long ago that, um, you could enter a test on the Xerox machine, I think it was, and then you feed all those answer sheets into the Xerox and it tells you, gives you all the answers, you know? So it, so it's just kind of a mark sheet and you just score on the mark sheet, puts it into the photocopier and it tells you how many people answered question one and question two and, and, and kind of answers every single sheet. So, and it took, it took less than, two minutes i think to run through 20 papers um so there are quicker ways of doing some of that stuff and when we talk about technology there are quicker ways of doing some of that stuff as well yeah fair i mean look obviously we, we've kind of had a rant about kind of education yeah we have <laughs> so i'm going to stop and, and actually talk about the positives of education very briefly yeah. right i mean yeah. education this year teachers and, ed, and school staff across the world have been on the front line they've been risking their lives every single day and, and have been absolute heroes to, to the globe um i mean like you i know you've been doing absolutely amazing things over in the cayman islands i mean i know you've had to feed families and you've you, you've gone the extra mile and and very much so like some schools in the uk in the prior areas i mean yeah Talk about the, the, the amazing things that you've been doing this year for your kids. All I can say is, you know, I'm, I'm in awe of some of the, the, the teachers and the educators that, are, that have been out here that have straight away, when the pandemic hit, were, right, we need to feed families. We need to get on, on, on board. So they, you know, spoke to outside agencies, people to sponsor and whatever else. Mm-hmm. To, you know, some schools are feeding over 150 families, you know, you know, I know in the high school, there are 150 f- families, a primary school that's had over 500 students, they were feeding up to, to 200 in that area, families a day, you know, and staff were going out with their masks on and, and giving children and their families food and food parcels day in, day out. We had... Um, we, we, we spoke to the internet companies, we spoke to other companies to make sure that every child, and this is, this is amazing, to make sure that every child has an electronic device in their home so that they can access the curriculum. Now, we're talking about 5,000 students. Okay, because we didn't, we didn't look at the, the private schools, we just looked at the 5,000 students that were in, in the schools here. They went out and they, they, they provided electronic devices and then 
we spoke to the electronic, the, the internet companies to make sure that they provided internet service to some of those, those, those poorer families as well. They did so many different things and initiatives to make sure that not only could children access the curriculum, children were fed, they made sure that families were looked after. We had counsellors going out. We did mental health checks on, on people um, and, and teachers. We, we tried to ensure that we looked at people holistically. Um, and every day, people were out. Um, the, the island was locked down, but there were people that were exempt. Some of those were teachers, myself, you know, and we went out and we, and we tried to provide different things to different families all across the island. And, you know, these are things that kind of get forgotten because, you know, parents want their kids back in school and da, 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 they're driving me mad or whatever else. Uh, and across the world, they're talking about, you know, finance, we've got to get kids back into schools. But just taking a moment to think about these, because they say, oh, teachers didn't do anything because schools were closed. Well, actually, <laughs> they did a hell of a lot, you yeah. know, and I just take my hat off to all those educators across the world you know, not just UK, not just in, in Grand Cayman, that did so much to provide support for those families, feed those children, you know, provide them with some sort of education. You know, it wasn't going to be the same as being in a classroom, but they provided it day in, day out. And some of those lessons were amazing, you know, um, assemblies and different things when you've got hundreds of children all, all logged on. So many innovative things. You know, the opportunity to use some of your expert teachers. So you've got an expert in maths. So instead of them just doing a lesson to their class, they could do it to three different schools at the same time. So there was so many different innovative things that were happening online to try and get some of the quality things, um, quality teaching out to, to, to students. So those kind of things, you know, I take my hat off um, to, to educators around the world. Absolutely. And, and it's a massive, like, again, in the UK, we, we haven't re really, as, as a public, and, and this is, in some respects, I'll absolutely blame the media and, and politicians, but the, the, the teacher profession hasn't been given any justice for, for what they've done this year, because, I mean, I speak to, spoke to so many head teachers and teachers across the country, across the world, but in the UK in particular, that they have like been in deprived areas and those kids haven't had a hot meal. I mean, the only hot meal that they got was during school. Like that's what, where they get their hot meal. And these teachers have sacrificed their own lunches and given them their lunch to take home with them so they can have a hot meal in the evening. You know, like teachers have been kind of out there on the streets, like getting donations for these children. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And feeding these families and giving them laptops like obviously yourself and like going the extra mile adapting to teaching yeah. online as well as in the classroom but doing both so you've got two you've got double the workload in some respects uh, and you yeah. have to teach, you know what i mean and teachers have been absolutely heroes this year and it just hasn't been kind of recognized in my opinion in, in, in the no, not at all not at all you know we had you know teachers that had their own children at home because everything's locked down For sure so they're having to try and organize their children and deliver classes, you know, um, leaving their own families to go and feed other people's families, yeah. you know, all of those things that never get mentioned, you know, having to leave their own children so that they could feed other people's children and, 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 and teach other people's children and, and those type of things that if the government had just said, you know what, thank you so much for what you're doing yeah. rather than actually you're not doing enough. Can we do that that's what it, it looks like from afar that the UK's kind of done. Yeah. And in, in another place, just get the schools open, just get the schools open. I don't really care if you catch COVID or, or whatever else. And I, I don't really seem to have a plan, but you know what, what are your schools open? Get everybody back in. Um, with no, with no kind of clear, thank you very much teachers for what you've done up until this point. Thank you so much. No, no, no. We want more from you. We want, we want another pint of blood from you guys. This is what we want now. I want and, to, I, and I think add, add it's not that. helpful. Add a, add a pay freeze to that as well in, in, for the public sector, like after, after the pandemic as well, uh, just to throw salt in the wounds. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. And the, it's a shame because the teaching profession, they, they've been on the front line every single day. And it, like we said, I mean, if it wasn't for teachers, like NHS staff wouldn't be able to go and save lives in, in hospitals. Do you know what I mean? And, right. Yeah. 
my sister, she's an assistant head teacher and she doesn't come to her parents' house because she's worried about passing something on to them because they're elderly. And it's not just about kind of being yourself, putting yourself on the front line, but you're also like sacrificing meeting your loved ones and doing the things that you want to be able to do because you're you're scared about the moral obligation that you have for your children. At you have, yeah. You know, and, and teachers have been absolute heroes. And my hat goes off to every educator out there because you've absolutely been like on the front line this year. And um, it's a shame you haven't been appreciated. But in some respect, this is what this, this podcast is about is it's to create awareness, talk about the issues in education, but also to give recognition to the people that deserve it. And in my opinion, it's the teachers and school staff that have been so active this year. Day in, day out, you know, in, in, in the face of so many different, you know, we had we had an earthquake which was which was quite hard and then we went into covid and then we had all these tropical storms and, and whatever else and throughout it all teachers provided work whether that was online whether it was in classrooms whether it was packets that they you know printed off 150 packets of work for, for students they made sure that it kept moving they kept making sure people were fed they kept making sure people were educated they kept making sure parents were okay, kept making sure grandparents were okay. They, they made sure their community that their schools were in were okay. And for me, you know, all I can say is, you know, teaching uh, again, I didn't think, I thought I'd seen it all, but again, they went up another notch this year, you know, teachers in my estimations. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, it's uh, obviously it's quite remarkable what they've done. And um, obviously it's, it's changed a lot in terms of the way that you kind of um, will probably perceive education and the way that you do things in the future. Obviously, there'll be things that you will naturally go back to, but there'll be a lot that you'll probably take take away from this. But I mean, what would you think the positives are of, of what's happened this year? Positives are, I think it's given us the opportunity and people to, um, not just teachers, I think, given another way of working. Because before we had to go on Zoom and had to do that stuff, everybody was like, oh no, you have to be in the office. Yeah, absolutely. Now everybody has a different way of working. Everybody now has the opportunity to say, you know what, I don't, I don't wanna work in the office today or I'm gonna do, do, do it on Zoom or, you know, if something was to, to happen again, if we have another lockdown, we know that we've got infrastructure in place to continue those lessons from the very next Monday. If we close down this Friday and we needed to, to get lessons on, we could get them on, on Monday. So I think it's also improved teachers' pedagogy. I know a lot of teachers were very, very worried at, at the start, like, oh, I don't really want to teach online. I don't know how I'm going to be and whatever else. They improved as time went on. They did. They did better. They found. They found more confidence, which improved their delivery and their dialogue. Because sometimes we have a lot of teacher talk or different things. But when you're online and you need that interaction, you, you're learning again a different skill set. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, the pandemic has taught people um, different ways of working. It's also taught people that the world is smaller than we think. That's another thing. Talk, the world is smaller than we think. The world closed down. You know, the world closed down. This wasn't isolated. We're not here and, and, and nothing, nothing affects us. Everything affects us. We are yeah. all in this together. So it's given this next generation coming through an idea that, oh, okay, we are part of a global community that, that wasn't there before. Um, and to, I think, uh, to, to be more caring and open and, 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 and you know, um, I wouldn't say the word tolerant, be, be, I guess, more loving to each other because I think um, the empathy has been quite high, especially here, I don't know about in the UK, because people have lost people. People haven't been able to travel and see people. They haven't been able to get a hug from their grandparent or whatever. All of those type of things have, have made people kind of a little bit more empathetic to people's plights and people's circumstances as well. 
Yeah, for sure. Do you think we're, we're kind of uh, focusing too much on trying to get the students to meet the curriculum needs instead of actually taking into consideration that we are facing a pandemic and the kids are surviving a pandemic? Like, do, you, do you think yeah. we're too focused on, on the curriculum needs side of it at the moment? I, I do think it is, is a massive thing. It's difficult because that's kind of what my job is, to make sure that people are hitting those, those milestones in schools. But I do think, yes, we, we, we're not looking at maybe the, 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 the more human side of, of, of what we've just been through, because it's a first, you know, in history, in human history, is a first that something has, has, has circled the whole globe at the same time. And I, I do think, yeah, we, we, we probably are concentrating far much more on something um, in terms of the outcomes than are these people okay? Yeah. And, uh, and again, it goes back to why I think that obviously the, 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 the views on what makes someone successful in education kind of need to change because now that, like, obviously with everything that's happened this year, like what you said earlier about manners and politeness and coming from a place of love and care and um, looking after thy neighbour like you want to be treated themselves, going back to biblical text, right? I mean, that has become so much more relevant this year and, and having those interpersonal skills opposed to like just being good at English, being good at maths and good being good at science you know and um i mean it's yeah i mean it's, it's a difficult year but empathy is one of the key words that you use that's come out of this year and and that's what we need to be towards the children i think is more empathetic and realize you know what you're going to be all right like it is to encourage them and realize you know what you become better people out of this you know you become more resilient and now you do go and do an even better job it doesn't matter that you didn't do your maths exam you're gonna you've you've grown as a person from this like well done yeah. you you survived it well done like, i mean why is though why are we not having those conversations with children i don't know but um i mean look, I, i've taken up a lot of your time nicholas i mean just before no. i go um, is there anything that in particular you want to get off your chest no not really i, I you know I've, I've really enjoyed the the opportunity to, to talk to you today i've really enjoyed the opportunity to kind of debate a couple of things and, and throw a few things back and forth um you know, I, you know, anybody that does watch this, you know, that are educators, again, I want to say, you know, you've done a stellar job this year and, and you know, in the face of, of so many different obstacles and so many different challenges and, and have still got up every day to try and provide the best possible education for those, those students. And, you know, I want to thank you, um, even if your governments don't, I just want to say thank you so much. Absolutely. And, and I want to second that, obviously. You guys have been absolute heroes. And I've said it so many times this year, but you have absolutely been heroes. And um, yeah, don't worry about the public and the media and, and uh, what the politicians say. You're there to make a difference to these kids. And every single day you're making a difference and saving some of these kids' lives. And uh, yeah, my hat goes off to all of you. And just keep up the good work. Please don't get disheartened because education is an, is an amazing thing. And you do create so much of an impact on, on these young people's lives. And Obviously, we need teachers, so please don't lose heart and, and just keep doing what you're doing because you're doing an amazing job. Yeah, definitely. Always be just mindful of what you say to a student because they may stop you in the street 10 years later mm -hmm. and you will never remember that conversation, but they will remember it. So yeah. make sure it's always a positive one and an uplifting one, you know, because you never know when it comes back and makes a difference that actually changes a young person's life. Amazing. No, we'll leave it there, Nicholas. I mean, we spoke about a lot. So, top man, thanks for coming on. Thanks for sharing your your no problem. wisdom. And uh, obviously, uh, let's keep in touch over over social media. Yeah, definitely. To see how you're getting on. Maybe we can catch up at the end of the academic year and, and see how you've progressed. Love to. Amazing. Yeah. Love to. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, mate. Look, all right. All right. Yeah. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Thank you.